Hello, and welcome to Project Strickland's Air Heater Detail Design Review. My name is Michael Chastain. I am the design team lead of Project Strickland. My assistant design team lead is Zechariah Anderson, who is also our test lead. Our manufacturing lead is Brian Stoll. Our instrumentation lead is Philip Kyler. Our liaison engineering lead is Katie Powell. Our safety lead is Ifa Abdul Latif. And our instrumentation assistant is Tim Taylor. I'll now take you through our project overview. Before we get into our presentation, I have a few key terms I'd like to go over that you'll see throughout the presentation. We'll begin with non-vitiation. This means to not impair the quality of the fluid. In our case, we do not want the primary fluid having byproducts of combustion mixed in with it. Our primary fluid is that non-vitiated air entering and exiting our air heater. Our working fluid is responsible for heating that said primary fluid. We have two different types of flames we'll talk about during our presentation. One is a pre-mixed flame where the fuel and oxidizer mix prior to ignition, and a diffusion flame where the fuel is supplied to the burner and it is ignited as the oxidizer is mixed in. We began with a purpose of designing an innovative prototype. We wanted to implement it with an existing system and we wanted to practice learning to design with manufacturing in mind. We were integrating instrumentation into a new design as well as an existing design, and we were culminating data acquisition and instrumentation practices throughout the process. We are also practicing safety implementation in both design and testing procedures, and this was all while we were assisting with the future of the ME446 lab course. Our requirements were mainly driven by producing a non-vitiated heated airflow. That heated airflow needed to be 300 <coughs> degrees above ambient temperature, and we had to take a few measurements throughout our system, um, which included two pressure measurements and five temperature measurements. We were also required to design a propane orifice run and interface with the current system in the propulsion laboratory. Once we confirmed that our system was operable, we were to acquire a temperature and velocity profile at the exit of our air heater. Here you can see a rendering of our overall design, which includes or uh, which maintains a non-vitiated primary fluid utilizing a crossflow heat exchanger design. It also attaches to the existing infrastructure in the propulsion laboratory and attaches or has an attachment for the exhaust to uh, have the working fluid leave the lab. Uh, leave the lab. We also insulated it um, to reduce heat loss and to keep the outer temperatures low. Here you can see our different fluid flow paths. On the right hand side, on the left hand side of the screen is our primary fluid that passes through to the right hand side. Um, this fluid is that non-vitiated air. The working fluid enters the bottom of the burner chamber and exits out of the exhaust. Again, this working fluid is heating the primary fluid. This is our crossflow heat exchanger design. It features a seven tube array with a triangular 60 degree pitch design which again allows for that non-vitiation. Our current prototype can be seen on the screen. Our exit on the left-hand side and our inlet on the right-hand side. Our blower is mounted to the bottom of the cart with an attachment to get to the blower entrance. Our fuel orifice run is mounted to the top of the cart as well as the air heater with the exhaust at the top. This is the opposite side of our current prototype with the inlet on the left-hand side and the exit on the right-hand side. The fuel orifice run wraps around from that previous picture into our inlet. The burner chamber door, removable, hangs below the cart top. Here's our current prototype of our orifice run. For instrumentation, we have on the left-hand side a thermal let, and in the middle are pressure taps. This is to measure the mass flow going through to our fuel. The ball valve on the left-hand side allows us to turn on and off the propane fuel, and the gate valve on the right-hand side is for throttling purposes. This is our inlet side of our current prototype. We have a pop-off valve and thermolet on the top, a compressor manifold inlet below that inlet, and our spark generator mounted to the side of the cart. Here you can see inside of our burner chamber. Our diffusion plate sits below our burner tubes, and its purpose is to diffuse the air coming in from our blower. The heat exchanger tubes sit on top of the burner tubes with insulation surrounding the entire thing. This is our exit side with another thermal lamp mounted above just like the inlet. This is for us to achieve our temperature difference throughout our air heater and our primary fluid. 
I'll now pass it off to Brian Stoll, who will take you through our manufacturing processes. Thank you, Michael. So the foundation of our air heater was a prefabricated cart. This cart is capable of supporting 400 pounds, and it already had caster wheels on the bottom, so we could easily transport it and also position it in the thermal fluids lab. On the top of the cart, we added a three-quarter inch piece of MDF wood, which will increase the stability of the top of the cart <laughs> and also allow for stiffer mounting locations. On the bottom of the cart, our blower is mounted, and connected to that is a HVAC insulated ducting, which is then routed to the bottom of the top of the cart. Our frame of our air heater is our internal structure for our air heater. It is made out of half inch square steel tube and 3 16 inch 836 steel. This frame is fully welded to maximize strength and also to minimize leakage. Bolts were also welded to our frame for mounting locations for, our, for all of our burner chamber walls. Our flame holder mount is made out of uh, half inch square steel tube again which is welded to the bottom of our frame, which will hold our flame holders. This, our frame, lastly, supports our perforated plate, which will be used for our quantum plate on the top of our frame. For our doors, our end plates, our top, our perforated plate, and all the other smaller pieces that we use as sheet metal, were all cut on the AxFab water jet. To use the AxFab water jet, we had to take our CATIA drawings and convert them into a DXF file. This DXF file had all of the pieces that we need to cut it out on a sheet of material, based on a size that would be cut out of the sheet of material that we bought. The material that we used for this was 836 hot rolled steel, and we also had two thicknesses of material that we used, one being 3 16th inch and one being quarter inch thick. While the water jet was accurate and efficient of cutting this, our holes did not line up with our frame since our frame, when it was being welded, warped. To fix this, we took a Dremel tool and we had to cut our holes out a little bit to make our bolts line up. For the 7-2 crossflow heat exchanger, we used seven one-inch thin-walled pipe that were 19 inches long. These were welded to our exit plate and when welding them, we had to use a truing plate so the heat exchanger tubes would not warp. On the inlet and exit plates, we also had to weld a reducer onto each side. To make our reducer centered with our heat exchanger, we had to make another jig that would center our reducer with our heat exchanger tubes. On the inlet plate, we also had to have a tight clearance fit for our heat exchanger tubes to slide into our inlet, which would prevent leakage from our working fluid into our primary fluid. On our propane burner system, we had a twin burner design. We had 20 inch, three quarter inch tubes that we used. They each had 104 tubes, or 104 holes per tube, and they were also drilled at 30 degree angles to push our heat up. We had uh, four control valves, one being a ball valve, a gate valve, and then two burner valves. These were, the ball valve was uh, threaded on, while the gate valve and the burner valves were welded on to prevent them from leaking. Our propane tank that we used had an inline pressure regulator and also a double seat valve. And our orifice run that we had was fabricated from three quarter, two three quarter inch pipes and also uh, an orifice plate. For our insulation, we used two different types of insulation, one being a fiber, ceramic fiber material, which was plain retardant and also had a low thermal conductivity at high temperatures. This material was self-supporting, so putting it on the inside of our box was quite relatively easy. This insulation enclosed our entire heat exchanger and our burner chamber on the inside, and it reduced our heat loss from our heat air heater, and also it reduced our outside temperature of our walls. And now I'll pass it off to Philip Kyler to talk about the instrumentation. Thanks, Brian. 
Our instrumentation was dictated by two things, our RFP and our safety needs. Our RFP required that we get the temperature rise in our primary fluid. Uh, we had to design an orifice run to measure the mass flow rate of fuel going into our system. And we had to be able to acquire the temperature and velocity profiles at our air heater exit. For safety reasons, we had to be able to monitor our flame temperature while we were testing. To get our temperature right, we placed thermocouples at the inlet and exit of our air heater. We installed these thermocouples using thermal LEDs, which were a quarter inch steel rod that were drilled out. We placed those thermal LEDs in our pipe and welded them in. We then filled those thermal LEDs with thermal conductive paste to improve the accuracy of our temperature measurement. To get those measurements, we went with J-type thermocouples. Our fuel orifice run was designed to the ASME standard you see above. Uh, it calls for three measurements, uh, temperature of the fluid moving through it, an upstream pressure, and a differential pressure across the orifice plate. Uh, using those three measurements, you can then calculate the mass flow rate. To get our upstream pressure, we went with a 0 to 30 PSIG omega pressure transducer. To get our differential pressure, we went with a 0 to 1 PSIG differential pressure transducer. And to get our temperature, we went with a J-type thermocouple. Here's an image of our prototype fuel orifice run. Our J-type thermocouple was inserted into a thermal LED by the ball valve, and our two pressure transducers were connected to the pressure taps that were welded onto our orifice run. To acquire our velocity and temperature profile, we used a temperature compensated pitot-static tube. This pitot-static tube was connected to a Velmex rail that was controlled by a motor that allowed it to traverse our air heater exit horizontally. That pitot-static tube took air temperature measurements and our total static pressure at the uh, exit of our air heater. To get our static pressure, we went with a 0 to 30 PSIG omega pressure transducer that we calibrated to account for atmospheric conditions. And we used a 0 to 5 PSIG pressure transducer to get our total pressure. Uh, for our temperature, we used a K-type thermocouple because this was what was embedded in our pitot-static tube. To monitor our flame temperature, we measured the flames in each corner using four thermocouples. We had to monitor the flame temperature so that when we put our door on during testing, we can ensure that our burner was still lit so we didn't have a buildup of propane in our system. To get these flame temperatures, we chose a J-type thermocouple. Here I show an image of the inside of our air heater. Circled in red are our thermal LEDs that were used to install our thermocouples. Uh, they sit right above our burner tubes so we can get accurate measurements. And then those thermal LEDs were covered with insulation to minimize our heat loss to the surrounding. <laughs> Here I show an instrumentation diagram of our system. So starting from our air tank, we then move into our primary fluid orifice run, which is already set up in the propulsion lab, so we didn't have to worry about the instrumentation for that. And then we move into our air heater system, which has a thermocouple at the inlet and exit to get our temperature rise. It has the four thermocouples along the bottom to monitor our flame temperatures. At the exit is our pitot-static tube that has a thermocouple and two pressure transducers to characterize our velocity and temperature profile. And then down at the bottom, we have our propane orifice run, that has a temperature, uh, upstream pressure, and a differential pressure to get our mass flow rate up. To acquire this data, we use the National Instruments Data Acquisition Systems. We use the NI9217, the CDAC chassis, to connect our DAC modules to our USB interface. We use the NI9205 to connect to our Omega pressure transducers. And we use the NI9212 to connect to our Omega thermocouples. We then process that data using the LabVIEW program. Here's a screenshot of that LabVIEW program. This program takes in all of our data and processes it. It takes our measurements from our fuel orifice run, runs it through a formula node, and then produces our mass flow rate of fuel and provides a live reading of that so we know how much fuel is going into our system during our test. It also provides a live reading of our flame temperatures so we can monitor those during our testing. And then it takes all of that data and writes it to an Excel file for later data analysis. I'll now pass it off to Ifa Abdul Latif for safety. Thank you, Philip. I will start with the air heater safety concerns. Uh, safety is really important in this project because we use propane as a fuel. As we know, propane is a combustible and hazardous. Dealing with a high pressure and high temperature can cause damage to the system. We also need to be aware of the uh, burner flame inside the air heater all the time. Before start testing the air heater, all personnel must understand and follow the protective equipment which is consists of all personnel must wear safety glasses, ear protections, uh, long sleeves, long pants and closed toe shoes. 
The person who will make a contact with the air heater need to wear thermal gloves. Need to make sure that there are two blast shields and a fire extinguisher in the testing parameter. Now I will talk about the air heater system safety features. The air heater, the air heater system safety features consist of uh, installing the ball valve on the fuel on the fuel orifice run and air orifice run. Ball valves help to uh, to allow the flow to be quickly turned off if needed. By installing the gap valves on the fuel orifice run and air orifice run, allow us to control the amount of fuel and the amount of compressed air flow into the air heater. The blower, which is located on the bottom of the car, helps us to mitigate the risk of the propane buildup in the air heater. The exhaust, which is located on the top of the air heater, helps to direct the hot, work, the hot working fluid outside to the propulsion lab. By installing thermocouples, uh, help us to, the, to check the temperatures of the air heater system at the inlet, exit, and inside of the air heater. Pop-up valve, which is located on the inlet of the air heater, help to mitigate the risk of blockage and also to avoid the pressure buildup within a primary flow. In addition, the air heater door is removable for maintenance and easy access. The hazard matrix shows in this slide shows the level of risk of the air heater system. The hazard categories begin with the catastrophic failure to the negligible. From the failure mode analysis shows in this slide, failure mode D, E, M, and N were deemed undesirable risk of levels that needed to be mitigated. Here we show how we mitigate the risk. To mitigate risk D, which is a primary flow blockage, uh, we need to make sure that the primary flow path is free from any debris. During testing, the test assistant operator was responsible for monitoring pressures inside the air heater system. During emergency, the emergency protocol that every personnel must uh, follow first is need to make sure that the ball valve is closed at the propane, propane line and the primary fluid. Next, need to exit propulsion lab. And then after that, need to call EMS then safety. After all personnel exit the facility, uh, need to allow at least 30 minutes for the primary fluid pressure to be equalized to the ambient pressure. To mitigate risk E, which is a working fluid blockage, need to make sure that the working fluid flow path are free from blockage. And during emergency, the emergency protocol for risk E is the same as risk D. To mitigate risk M, uh, which is a burn injury, uh, all personnel are required to wear long pants, long sleeve shirts, and also wear a thermal gloves. During emergency, need to make sure that the ball valve are closed at the propane line as well as on the primary fluid. Call EMS then safety if the severe burn occurs. To mitigate risk N, which is a propane buildup, need to make sure that always have the door off if the propane line is open and the blower off. During emergency, the emergency protocol for risk N is the same as risk D and E. Before start testing the air heater full system test, need to make sure that the subsystem of the air heater, which is the burner and working fluid, work perfectly. This is the burner and working fluid test positions diagram. As we can see here in this diagram, we tested the air heat, we tested the burner and working fluid outside of the propulsion lab. During the test, we did not uh, connect the, the air orifice run to the air heater. This is a full system test of uh, position diagram. As we can see here in this diagram, uh, we tested the air heater inside the propulsion lab with the, with the air orifice run uh, connected to the air heater. In case if there is emergency occurs, this is emergency exit path diagram that every personnel must follow to evacuate uh, the facility. The green star in, in the emergency meeting locations diagram uh, is aware that every personnel must meet after they evacuate the facility during emergency. To make sure that there are no propane left in, uh, inside the air heater, this is a propane line blow down procedure that every personnel must follow. First, need to make sure that the door is off and then after that, burn off any residual propane. Leave the blower on for at least 10 minutes to cool down the air heater cord. 
and at the same time keep the compressed air on to, pre to clean out the residual propane. Now I will pass to Zachariah Anderson to talk about system testing. Thank you, Eva. We began with subsystem testing. This, uh, we need to prove that each subsystem in our system could work independently, and we also tested them separately so to make sure that they were safe and controlled to operate. We started with the burner system test on April 9th, and we moved on to the working fluid test on April 13th. We finally wrapped up the subsystem testing with the primary fluid test on April 16th. We completed all of these subsystem testing before moving on to the full system test. Modifications were made to the system between each system subsystem testing to uh, account for any issues that may have occurred. We started with the insulation burn test. We had two types of insulation, the fiberglass-based insulation donated to us from GKN, and we had a ceramic fiber insulation donated to us by Baker Insulation. Um, we need, we took, cut small test squares of each type of insulation and used a propane torch to apply a direct flame to each insulation. We chose the ceramic fiber insulation after it had no visible defect um, with the direct flame uh, in contact. We uh, moved on to the pressure test. We needed to make sure that the fuel inside the system could be contained while the, ball or the uh, valves were closed and would not leak. We did this by splitting our fuel system in half and then attaching a modified bike hose to the end of our orifice run. We then pressurized the fuel system with a bike pump to 100 PSI to make sure that all the valves are pulled uh, to significantly higher pressures than what our system was designed to handle. And it passed on the first attempt with no leaks. We then moved on to the fuel ignition test. We needed to make sure that the fuel could be relighted, re ignited reliably and remotely from within our system. This test was conducted outside, so in case we did not get the propane to light correctly, the propane could be vented to the atmosphere without building up inside the propulsion lab. The test did not pass at first due to the fact that the propane was not uh, rich enough to catch fire with the igniters, and so we modified our inlets to include a tape to force the air or fuel to build up rich inside of uh, burner tubes and then eject into our burner chamber and forcing the diffusion flame. The idea, ideal flame is to have a premixed flame. It burns stoichiometric, cleaner, and hotter. Um, it was initially diffusion because we had to force it to get it to our igniters to work. Um, the, the diffusion flames also proved to be unstable and ununiform in our system. We modified the system, to, the burner system, to include a compressor air manifold. Um, this forces air alongside our fuel into the burner tubes at the inlet and, forces, and it mixes the fuel inside the burner tube so that it uh, forms a pre-mixed flame. This maintained a pre-mixed flame at low to medium fuel flow rates and still burned a little rich on the diffusion side at high fuel flow rates. We moved on into the distribution test. We need to make sure that the fuel burned evenly along the entire length of our burner tubes. This is so that heat would be distributed evenly along the length of the heat exchanger. This allows for better heat transfer and would allow for higher um, temperaturizing our system. We found that without any modifications in the system, that the propane burned even unevenly at medium to high fuel flow rates. We modified the base of our uh, air heater to include a perforated um, diffuser plate at the bottom of the air heater and two flame holders to hold a pocket of stagnant air directly above the burner tubes. This allowed the fuel to burn in a diffusion, pre diffusion and pre-mixed flame at a uniform and steady flow rate. We moved on to the leak test, where we bolted the, the door onto the cart and sealed all of the leak or all of the panels and sidewalls to the, the frame with a high temperature silicon. We tested the, the seals with a uh, soapy based liquid uh, to identify any leaks with the bubbles that it produces. The leaks were found to be extremely minimal and of no risk. The primary fluid test followed immediately after that, and we um, we needed to make sure that our design fuel or primary fluid mass flow rate of 0.2 pound mass per second could be sustained for as long as we needed it to. We found that it blew down from 0.2 pound mass per second to 0.1 pound mass per second within 30 seconds, and so we had to modify our procedures to account for the short run time. I will now pass it off to Tim Taylor to talk about the overall testing results.
Things that grow. So here in this picture here, you can see our whole system set up in the propulsion lab. We have the, uh, the air orifice run attached to our air heater, and also with our computer with LabVIEW running in the background. So for our full system data collection, there's a few things we had to collect. Uh, our temperature readings, there was quite a few of them. We needed inlet and exit temperatures. We needed propane temperatures, flame temperatures, and also a temperature profile. We also needed to acquire pressure readings for a propane orifice run. This included our upstream pressure and our differential pressure, which helped us calculate the mass flow rate. On the right, you can see an ideal temperature profile of what we expected to see in our system. So on our first test on the 16th of April, we had a delta T measurement that was much lower than we expected. We only achieved 16.3 degrees Fahrenheit above ambient. The reason this, this happened is because it attributed low flame temperature. We were forcing a diffusion flame, and we were burning rich. Our expected average flame temperature was right around 700 degrees Fahrenheit. We only achieved 175 degrees Fahrenheit. So our fuel mass flow rate was also higher than we expected. We calculated 0 0.001 pound mass per second, but we also measured 0 0.002 pound mass per second. Again, we think this is because we were forcing a diffusion flame and it was, non, it was, oh, it was not a pre-mixed flame. <coughs> so we had to make some design improvements to our, our system because it wasn't giving us what we wanted. So we considered a couple of types of uh, burners, a diffusion versus premix. We end up choosing the premix flame because this gives us a venturi effect. We had to overcome the back pressure in the burner tubes with this compressor manifold by forcing the compressed air into the burner tubes to cause a premix, a premixture. The compressed air manifold was made from PVC and compression fittings and was also attached using uh, aluminum ducting tape. So on our overall test number two and three, Connected on the 19th of April, a little later in the week, we retested to, uh, to achieve a better delta T in our system. The compressor manifold again gave us an enhanced Venturi effect. It stabilized our fuel flow rates across our burners, and we could also adjust the throttle and compressor manifold to a certain pressure so we could get the mass flow rate air coming out of the compressor. We also achieved a much higher flame temperature on this particular test. Our average flame temperature for this test ended up reaching 687 degrees Fahrenheit, and we also achieved a much higher delta T of 167 degrees Fahrenheit. On tests four and five, they were conducted on the same day. After we had already optimized our fuel air mixture and we were ready to run and achieve our temperature profiles, we acquired two at the exit. We ran this test twice to ensure accuracy of our measurements. The first test was conducted on a cold system, and the second test was conducted on a warm system. Here in this diagram, you can see the actual temperature profile that we acquired on our first test. It is offset due to the fact that we have a large temperature gradient in the back of our system. It is starting to form a parabolic shape, but not exactly what we want. Again, on the second test, we achieved a very similar profile. Again, we are getting an offset in the parabol parabolic form, and that is again due to the large temperature gradient we're having in the system. So for our post-test analysis, what we expected to see is not what matched our experimental profile. Our profile increased linearly across our system. And again, this is because we had a large temperature gradient on the right side of our burner. And we also did not have sufficient time to reach steady state conditions. I will now pass it off to logistics. Katie Powell. Thank you, Tim. So here you can see a breakdown of our budget. Uh, at the beginning of our, pro of our project, we were given $1,000 to design, build, and test uh, this air heater. On the left-hand side, you can see all of our main vendors that we sourced our raw materials and our parts from. Uh, the miscellaneous row are, were just small purchases, under $20 that we made, mostly through uh, just our design modification process. Uh, the expected total can be seen in the middle column. Uh, those include our subtotals and any, any quotes that we were given from vendors. And the right side shows our actual totals. These are post tax and also include uh, shipping and handling fees. With all that in mind, we were able to come in about $150 under budget, and with our total being $855.39. At the beginning of this semester, as a team, we decided that each team member needed to put in 12 hours outside of class per week. Uh, this line can be seen in the green. 
Uh, our actual hours, we came in at about 1,400 hours this semester, and that line total can be seen in the red. So as Michael mentioned earlier, there were some requirements that our project needed to meet. Uh, first and foremost, we were looking for that uh, 300 degree temperature rise above ambient. Uh, we did not entirely meet this requirement, however, we were able to get our temperature rise up of um, 167 degrees above ambient. However, on a more positive note, uh, we were able to produce that non-vitiated flow uh, through the, our cross flow heat exchanger design, uh, so we were able to keep those two streams separate. Uh, we were successful in measuring all of our pressures and temperatures that we needed to measure. Uh, we were successful in not only designing propane, propane orifice run, but also building, testing, and using it uh, to acquire our mass flow rate of propane going into our system. And we were able to acquire a temperature, block, <coughs> temperature profile at the exit of our air heater. Uh, however, we were unable to acquire a velocity profile. So some of the recommendations uh, that we have from the lessons that we've learned uh, through not only this semester, but last semester as well. Um, the aspect of fabrication, uh, we learned that it's always good to purchase extra material. Um, uh, so we would recommend that any further work uh, certainly purchase extra material just for quick design modifications uh, as they go through uh, testing. Uh, we also suggest fabricating a more secure uh, compressor manifold. Right now, it is made out of PVC and it worked great for our project, but it would be nice to make um, just a more secure one out of steel piping. Moving into testing, um, as a wise detail professor told us all semester, Murphy gets a vote and nothing will ever work on your first uh, test. Uh, so from this, we want to recommend uh, allowing twice as much time for testing as you think you need. Uh, it's also a very iterative process. You know, it's test, redesign, test, redesign. Um, so certainly allowing more time uh, would really help or would be a good way to go. Uh, we also suggest creating a checklist of equipment needed for each test. Uh, this is so nothing is overlooked and the um, team is ready to go um, and have everything in order uh, before testing begins. Uh, we also want to suggest running a test uh, with more fuel and more air throttled into the system to really try to create that hotter flame and that 300 degree temperature rise. Uh, yeah. In the aspect of instrumentation, we learned that debugging instrumentation is very frustrating and it, it does take up a lot of time. So we would certainly suggest allowing a lot more time to debug the instrumentation to get all of it working. Uh, we also want to suggest using pre pressure transducers with a smaller range. Uh, smaller ranges do equate to smaller uncertainties, which are always great um, for a lot better for, uh, for data. Uh, also, we would suggest, or we learned, that uh, we need to make sure all of our lab view codes are working entirely uh, before we try to start testing. Uh, our air heater code that took all of our flame temperatures and our propane mass flow rate worked wonderfully. Uh, we did run into some issues though with our lab view for the primary orifice run as well as our primary flow orifice run as well as our velocity uh, profile measurement. I'll now pass it off to Michael Chastain for closing remarks. Thank you, Katie. Going throughout the preliminary design and the detailed design, we had a lot of help along the way. I'll begin with our faculty of Dr. Ron Okche, Dr. Michael Fabian, Dr. Matthew Hoslam, and Dr. Brenda Haven, who were a great help going through the class, kept us in the right direction, and made sure that we were asking ourselves the correct questions. Dr. Elliot Breiner and Dr. Daniel Danley were instrumental in our instrumentation implementation. Professor Andy Garrett, who is the chair of our mechanical engineering department here, um, was not only a great help in our classroom, but was able to contact GK and Aerospace, to have, uh, who was gracious enough to donate us insulation for our system. Jeff Hyatt, Patrick David, and Ernie Stokesbury, our AXFAD technicians here, um, we were with them almost the entire semester, and they were helping us make sure that we were using our, the tools properly and helped us with different design changes we were making. For our sponsors, um, we had a lot of different sponsors that were able to make this project happen. Barrett Propane donated propane and propane accessories. Um, Baker Insulation, as well as Builders Wholesale, worked together to get a ceramic insulation, uh, which was pivotal for our design. Uh, GKN Aerospace, again, was gracious enough to donate us insulation that was used between the cart and the air, uh, air heater itself. Over 9,000 Productions helped us with our media needs, including our logo design and Scott Kelly was able to cut out the logo you see here on the cart. 
This concludes Project Strickland's final presentation. Are there any questions? guys and it flowed well from start to finish so well done on that on the bike pump test pressurize the system um, it sounds pretty primitive but actually often a primitive idea is the best idea of all but when you test it you get the impression that you ordered up the pressure it worked and that was the end of the test is that right or did you re did you pressurize depre uh, pre depressurize and then pressurize again several times we actually did a couple of iterations. Um, this is when we did find, uh, oh no, we didn't have a leak during this test. Um, the, uh, we did that twice for each side. We separated it as the orifice run is two pieces. Um, we pressurized each side and then repressurized each side to make sure that the uh, gaskets weren't leaking or anything like that. And the second time we did it, um, we made sure that uh, the pressure was actually holding and it wasn't really slowly uh, escaping the system. So you pressurized to 100. What was the design number? Uh, 25. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. In, in which case, two, two goes was probably there. Um, I'll go back, right back to the beginning, slide nine, which was the, um, the one that shows, yeah, shows the tubes. How, how did you decide, or was it decided for you, seven tubes, what was the diameter, and how did you decide 60 degrees? Sure, I'll pass this off to Brian Stoll. So when we were making our design of our heat exchanger, uh, we actually had uh, all options for us. So we could pick how many tubes we wanted, we could pick the layout, and we could pick everything. So the reason we came up with seven tubes was part of our, uh, our Q equation, you know, uh, as our surface area. So it, was, it just kind of fit the size that we were looking to build. And then we picked that 60 degree pitch with our triangular pitch was because you could, uh, with the working fluid blowing over our heat exchanger, that layout created more turbulence over our heat exchanger, which increased our heat transfer coefficient. Okay, you would have had a different pitch configuration, I guess, with a different size of tube or a different number of, of tubes. Did you try and do any sort of optimization there? Or did you just find seven tubes looked about right? Oh. <laughs> uh, no, actually, there was a lot of iterations of this. We, we uh, actually, the being the last semester, we had 54 tubes. So it was a much different design, but you know, we came from, we had a lot of tubes. We went from 20 some tubes. We had, it was kind of like a cost thing also, because mm -hmm. we had to fit our budget. Sure. So seven tubes, uh, it, was, it was above what we thought we were going to need but it was also cheap enough for us to manufacture. Okay, that's fine. And final question, uh, really for Katie on the logistics. Why were you able to acquire the velocity profile? Uh, so with that, um, we are, um, our pressure transducers on our pedostatic tube uh, were giving us uh, faulty measurements and we sat there and tried to debug them for about five or six hours um, during that test and we just weren't able to um, get those velocity measurements, and we or not those pressure measurements, uh, because those pressure me measurements do factor into the velocity equation that is in that lab view code that also we were uh, running into some trouble with. Um, so, because we weren't able to get uh, those two separate pressure uh, measurements, we weren't able to uh, to achieve that velocity. Profile. So, it really, was it just a time constraint? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Definitely reiterate the great job. Uh, appreciate the presentation. Uh, it flowed very well, and you guys are great presenters, so applaud you for that. Thank you. Um, on slide four, you explained to me something, and I'm not a thermal guy, so thank you. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> that was per a uh, recommendation from last semester. All right, <laughs> good, good. So on slide six, you talked about requirements. So the idea is for this to be used in a lab here, correct? Yes, sir. All right, so typically with lab equipment, what uh, what specs come with lab equipment? Like nominal values maybe, maybe accuracy of values. So was there any accuracy of these requirements? Um, 
So 300 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, delta T, plus or minus one degree, five degree, is there anything like that? Uh, as far as our RFP went, no. Um, this was really the first iteration at making something that would accomplish this uh, goal for ME446. Um, so it was an idea of this wants to be done in the ME446 lab course. Let's see if we can make it happen. Okay, was, was that ever discussed as a team, even though it wasn't in the requirements or anything like that? No, sir. Perhaps something to build on, but uh, definitely a great job. I mean, our RFP is what it is, so you've got to answer that first, right? Going above and beyond, you don't necessarily get branded home for that. So. <laughs> <laughs> on slide 26, you did something really key here uh, that a lot of people miss, and it's the first bullet. You guys quoted the standard. Um, that's great practice, keep doing that. Um, that gives you a lot of credibility in your decision making and your design process. So great job with that. All right, so the actual question I have for you guys. <laughs> Slide 38 talks about uh, system safety features. Curious at all, uh, is a check valve necessary on the propane line? It, was that considered? Uh, the check valve is actually part of the pressure regulator on the propane line so that it okay. doesn't run back into the propane tank. Perfect, that's my question, good job. I think I just have one more question. Sure. On the requirements, kind of closing things out, did we meet stuff, did we not meet stuff, slide 76. Can you guys openly talk about maybe why things weren't met, why things were met, uh, how you can meet those in the future? Uh, basically, as a customer, uh, I see, okay, I've got you know, four out of six requirements met. How do I get to full six requirements met? How do I get closer to those requirements met? Can you talk to that at all? Sure. Um, as far as heating the air to that 300 degrees, uh, we were able to achieve 167 on um, this was after a lot of tunability, or not tunability, but um, using the tunability of the system to get the type of flames that we were looking for. Um, the side of combustion with this project is um, we designed a awesome heat exchanger. Um, but as far as uh, the uniform temperature distribution that you'd like to have, it just doesn't normally happen. So we designed the burner so that we could change things out um, going forward. Uh, we'd like to change, um, or we would like to see what would change with different fuel pressures um, and different compressor manifold pressures, which we didn't really want to mess with as we were using a PVC manifold. Um, and we'd also like to try different burner tubes. Um, there was some CFD analysis done um, at the beginning and uh, during last semester on what tubes we should use. And we got a pretty good distribution when we made all the different holes different sizes. Um, but that was a huge lead time on fabrication. Um, so we went with the design that we have now, and it was pretty close, um, enough to start testing. Yeah, that's a great answer, right? spot on. Uh, definitely add that to the presentation, right? Here's how we move forward, uh, whether that's another team picking it up, or hey, you can give this back to me, now I go pay someone else to finish it, right? Yeah. Um, great job. Definitely reiterate the, the presentation and, and the skills and, and presenting and everything. Keep explaining why things are happening uh, as you did throughout. Good luck to you. Thank you. On behalf of all of us. <laughs> <laughs> Again, uh, thank, uh, good job everyone. You guys did a really good job. Uh, and I just, while well, we have the requirements up here still, uh, as a system engineer, I appreciate that you came back to this list again and reiterated these are the ones that we met, these are the ones that we didn't. Uh, and I thought that was really good. Uh, also your risk analysis, I thought that was really good. Uh, you did a very good job of highlighting all potential risks to safety and how you can mitigate those, and then you applied it in, uh, in your testing. And I thought that was, that was really good, uh, and that enables us to keep doing projects like this, so that's really important. Absolutely. Um, so slide 74, um, I, was just, I just noticed that pretty much every single category, uh, your price increased a little bit. Uh, can you explain what happened there? I'll pass it off to Katie. Uh, do you mean between the expected and the actual totals? Yes. 
Okay, so the expected total was our subtotals. Uh, those were just what we were quoted or what we got as a subtotal on the website. Um, it, the actual totals include all of our taxes, all the shipping that we had to pay for, um, you know, for manufacturers that weren't local, um, any other, you know, I think we might have had one piece that was custom cut um, from Prescott Steel, so that added, you know, a few more dollars onto there. Yep, I, I figured something like that, just wanted to check. Yeah. Um, I think most of my other questions were answered, um, but uh, how about, what's some of the biggest lessons that you learned from this? Because it seems like this was uh, pretty well, uh, like it worked mostly really well, but I know that there are pl plenty, of, <laughs> plenty of things to learn from this. Sure, I think it's actually answered. I think the most important thing you can do is start testing early and often. Even if that's even as early as prelim, you just do a super simple micro test of, can we get a burn or two from like a propane grill that would work? And if that can work, can we just use that system in our system and simplify our, our project to debugging and mod fabrication and all that stuff. That would, if we could start testing early and often, that would save us a lot of time and it would also help improve our project. Uh, and then maybe I missed this, uh, but what sort of practical application did you have for this, or is it just demonstrating a technology? Um, the ME446 lab course is a new course that's being implemented, or is implemented, um, or has been, I'm saying it all wrong. There's an ME446 lab course. Um, it's basically the next step in instrumentation, and in that class, um, or that lab, the purpose or one of the experiments that wants to be done, or um, say, gather the thoughts. In that class and lecture and lab, whatever, um, there is a experiment that wants to be ran that there is a test cell after our system where the students can apply different instrumentation techniques and learn about instrumentation across maybe a piece of composite or a turbine blade or something um, that's having a heated flow pass over it. Um, that was why non-vitiation was our biggest <coughs> requirement, is it's used for that afterwards. Um, the practical application would be that it heats air pretty well. Um, other than that, it was designed specifically for that lab course. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I go really good job. Um, I also am aware that you guys were in a kind of a panicked condition on the unstable <laughs> plane. And so we did a good job of covering that and making it very transparent in this presentation. <laughs> we had uh, some help from this on? No, it died. Uh, uh, we had help from Dr. Fabian on that. I want to give him some props for that. Uh, we went in there and we went, we don't really know what we should do from here. Do you have any recommendations? And he was like, well, you talked about the Venturi effect and that it's not happening, make it happen. Um, so we, <laughs> we made the interior <laughs> uh, so that we could get the premix flame. Um, talking with Dr. Briner as well when we were testing, uh, we played with the flame holders and played with the different fuel flow rates, and he explained to us what the difference was between a premix and a diffusion. And after that, it started making a whole lot more sense. Um, so we decided to go with the compressor manifold, and it really fixed our flame distribution. Sometimes the best advice is just to listen to the advice. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I also want to really echo the, the comments on safety presentation. And we were, you know, last semester we were really concerned about the safety. <laughs> <laughs> For the record, last semester this was also three feet long. It was handling 125 psi, and it was a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> so we have come a long way in the past four months. Just wanted to be sure to know when we were testing. Yes. Um, everybody wanted to watch. <laughs> Far away. <laughs> um, however, you know, you, because of the safety concerns, you know, one of your, your most detailed and long presentations of the day was on safety, which is exactly as it should have been. And I really liked how you worked with risk cubes and then broke out the highest high risk guys elements and, and went through the details of it. I thought that was really good. Um, we did have one question on that though, the, with the safety procedures. You went through a nice description of what your safety procedures were. Was everyone on the team briefed on those safety procedures? Or were they going to tell you when the plane, when the thing's blowing up, are you handing out the safety procedures? <laughs>
Uh, yes. Um, prior to each experiment, not only before we started experimenting like for that session, each experiment we would make sure each person knew exactly what they were supposed to do in each event. Very good. And where do you, you did have temperature measurements on the surfaces, on the outer surfaces, like the virus plant. That was one of the first tests we did. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Thank you very much. Absolutely. A really, really good job. Um, very, very pleased with the transformation from last semester. Um, Learned a lot. Yeah, the, the, uh, you showed a picture of the testing inside the propulsion lab hooked up to the um, piping system. Um, how are you exhausting the gases in that configuration? Go ahead. This the one inside. Yeah. You had a schematic of it. Yeah, so oh, you okay. can't really see it here, yeah. but we have a stainless steel uh, tubing attached to that, and it's running out the garage door laying across the ground, okay. and it's about 15 feet long. That's probably a really good thing to mention when you're, you know, when you're doing the safety thing, or you have that, that schematic okay. of, and we tested it inside, and thinking, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> we did know where the, the emergency the stop line was, and open the vents and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> that was part of the uh, safety procedure. Um, the, uh, you mentioned that you did some modifications to your subsystems. Did you go back and retest those after you modified them? Yes, we did leak tests and pressure tests and we made sure everything was working again. But the functionality test, you said you made some modifications after you had tested on it and then you, from a, from a functionality standpoint, from a performance standpoint? Yes, yeah, so we started testing and then up until the next test it was design, rechange, and then test it again until we got something that okay. was what we're looking for. Great, that feedback loop is, is really important. Um, um, so I'm glad you, you did it said, oh yeah, that was broken, we fixed it, <laughs> we're done. <laughs> um, so you, you, you modified the bottom of the, of the chamber um, by putting a perforated plate, you said, mm -hmm. trying to even that yes. out going over the flames. So, so that, that's in my mind, and then you have this temperature profile that doesn't look quite, quite uniform. So my question is, what would you do to try and even out that temperature profile? Um, I think, um, so what you can see here is that the flames are kind of tall on the right side. What we think was happening is that the velocity of the uh, compressor manifold and fuel mixing together was spitting to the far side of our burner tubes and then the burner holes weren't choking the flow. So most of the fuel was kind of burning on the right side of our chamber and it wasn't flowing all the way back to the entrance of our burner tube. So we're, kind of, we're getting more flame and more heat on the right side and that's what led to... Um, so your profile is from where? Where, where yeah, are you? That's, that's, oh, that's, so, yeah. Uh, Right. Uh, so our profile was oh, measured uh, horizontally from front to back. Um, when we were yeah, there, we go. Um, when we were testing, uh, this graph actually is um, this temperature versus position. So this is if you're looking down um, onto the box. Um, so when we were testing, we noticed that our flame temperatures on our front burner were um, cooler than the flame temperatures on our back burner. Just keep going. Okay. Um, can, can you point to front burner, back burner? Yes. Alright, so our front burner is, uh, is this burner tube, and our back burner is the burner tube back here. Uh, we traversed um, from front to back, so that's, that is that uh, temperature profile. Um, and so, the, uh, like I said, the front temperatures for the flames were cooler than the, uh, the flame temperatures on the back. Um, we believe this is because a lot of the fuel was going into that first burner tube and not as much was getting to the second burner, or the back burner. <laughs> back in front. More fuel was going to uh, the back burner because it was that first tube than was getting to the front burner. Um, so that's what caused um, a hotter temperature on the back side of our system. Um, to mitigate that, I think it would just be um, choking the flow in those, or in those injectors making sure that uh, we are getting even amount of fuel into both of those burner tubes. So how did you, do, how did you do, um, uh, what, what are the size of the holes that you used for the, uh, uh, 
um, for the uh, burners, for the propane line, for the propane coming out. What size hole is it? How do you determine that? Your size hole is your little it's eighth inch, it's 0.125, and then the spacing's 0.225 inches. And the way, way we did this is we went down to the grill on campus as they cook all the hamburgers and everything on. And we messed with that for two days, just trying to take measurements and look at it and try to match that and see if we could build a burner. And then do hamburgers. Yep. <laughs> so we talked with Patrick. We tried to get a different top made so we could do a botchy thing, but he didn't want to do it. So. <laughs> Probably wise. <laughs> <laughs> hey, really, really good job. You're doing the presentation. It's a good job from all you guys, and, and uh, I probably spent as much time with you guys as anybody in this whole process. And, uh, the point I'd like to make, besides the fact that I really like anybody that likes to play with fire, <laughs> is that. Um, the science, the math, all the knowledge can be gained, but it really doesn't mean a thing without determination and commitment. And the one thing I'd like to leave you guys with is the, um, like, don't be 90 percenters of your life. Be 100 percent initiatives. And then you'll see for sure. So, good job, and I really enjoyed the time you spent with you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff.